because I, I don't call him Pastor Cozette, I just call him Brad. Uh, we go back a long ways, and uh, uh, glad to be with you this morning. Uh, fortunately, he's not able to be here because of his uh, uh, grandfather passing away, um, and uh, as I hear, he's traveling back, so let's remember to keep him in our prayers uh, to be, for safety, as uh, hopefully he'll be returning this evening. Um, but uh, it's good to, to be with you. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Colin Meshi. Uh, my lovely wife, Faith, is over there, along with our four kids. And uh, we are from Bucksport. We go to Bucksport Bible Church. I'm the, the youth pastor and an elder in our church. Um, I also work in our Christian school. And I have a couple of businesses as well to try and uh, make ends meet. So uh, we're a, a busy young family, but uh, happy to have the opportunity to be here with you all and, and worship our great Savior and uh, also uh, bring the message here this morning. And uh, so uh, let's begin by uh, opening in a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? Our great Heavenly Father, we are, are blessed to be able to gather together to worship you. And may we come before you here this morning with hearts uh, that are prepared to do just that that we humble ourselves before you and we recognize how great of a God that you are and how weak and frail we as human beings are and how we are in desperate need of you, of a relationship with you, and how we realize that it's only possible uh, through your Son, Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for the, the gift of salvation uh, that was brought to us through your Son for His finished work on the cross and His uh, resurrection. So we, we, we come before you here today recognizing that and we pray that, that as we sing, as we read Scripture, and as we hear from your Word, may you be honored, honored and glorified alone. And so we ask your blessing on our time together. May we be changed to be more like the image of your Son. For it's in His name I pray. Amen. Uh, one other announcement, and, and that is just that I'm going to try and follow the, the uh, uh, schedule that's been given to me. Um, of course, you know, every church does things a little bit differently, so I'll try to follow that as closely as I can, because I know that's what you're used to, um, but if I mess up or do something a little weird, just, uh, just smile and nod at me, and uh, we'll, we'll go on from there, okay? Um, but we're going to start by singing, Holy, 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 and so would you stand with me uh, as we sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
You may be seated. And we are going to sing uh, from the Psalter, God is our refuge and our strength. It's 46A. Um, but from the Psalter, God is our refuge and our strength. I'll play it through once. Okay.
The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation. How greatly shall he rejoice. Thou hast given him his heart's desire, and hast not withholding the request of his lips, Selah. For thou preventest him with the blessings of goodness. Thou settest a crown of pure gold on his head. He asked life of thee, and thou gavest it him, even length of days forever and ever. His glory is great in thy salvation. Honor and majesty hast thou laid upon him. For thou hast made him most blessed forever. Thou hast made him exceeding glad For the king trusteth in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High he shall not be moved. Thy hand shall find out all thy enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Their fruit shall not destroy from the earth, and their seed from among the children of men. For they intended evil against thee. They imagine a mischievous device which they are not able to perform. Therefore shalt thou make them turn their back, when thou shalt make ready thine arrows on thy strings against the face of them. Be thou exalted, Lord, in thine own strength, so will we sing and praise thy power. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated, and we will sing, Glorious things of thee are spoken.
uh, read together Galatians 2. Stand with me, Galatians 2, 15 through 21. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. For I from the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Amen. You may be seated again. And uh, before we dive into God's Word, let's sing The Church is One Foundation. Uh, thank you to uh, our musicians 
Uh, it might seem daunting to stand up here and sing in front of everybody, but with uh, these ladies playing uh, so nice, it's a piece of cake, trust me. <laughs> That and uh, Joe, you know, turning the mic down so you don't have to listen to just me. That's always helpful as well. <coughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to be in Ephesians chapter 1 this morning. Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, just to, to, to be up front with you, this is something that I had prepared um, for our youth group. And uh, so, if, I, if you feel like I am uh, underestimating your age this morning, because I am, and I'm going to treat you all like teenagers. Amen. And yes, it's going to make you feel great. And uh, you're going to leave here this morning feeling young and uh, rejuvenated and ready to take on the world for Jesus Christ. Pizza for lunch. Yeah, right, and pizza for lunch, absolutely. Uh, because, uh, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't that be awesome, though, if you left here and you just had all this energy and you said, man, I just want to, I just want to serve the Lord. And that's one of the things that I think is one of the most exciting things about working with young people, but also one of the most challenging things. Because, uh, uh, when you see young people, they are just full of life, aren't they? I mean... Uh, and if, if you wonder what that's like, you can watch some of my children as we leave, because they won't, they probably will not walk out of here. They will bounce out of here. And we're constantly saying, stop, stop, behave yourself, you know, walk, walk, you know, don't, and they're just bouncing everywhere. Where does that energy come from? It's because they're, they're youthful. And, and it, sad to say it, but someday they're going to be older and they're going to be dragging their feet like the rest of us. Like, oh, okay, i got to go to church. But, but spiritually, if we could, if we could be like that, um, youthful and, and excited for Christ, that would be, that would be great. And, and I want to share with you, I, I, I entitled this message uh, a question. And the question for you is, are you a Christian miser? Are you a Christian miser? Now, miser is an old word. We don't use it a whole lot. And when I say the word miser, what comes to my mind is, uh, is a, a book that our high schoolers are required to read in English class called Silas, Silas Marner. And uh, Silas Marner was this guy, and he, was a, he, he became old, and what he did was he hoarded his, his gold. Right? He would... He, he, uh, uh, he was a, a, a weaver, and he, he would make money by weaving, and then he would take his money, and he just hid it in his house. And he, and he hoarded it, and he would take it out, and he would count it. And he would look at it, and he loved it, and then he would hide it again. And he, he didn't spend it. And uh, I'll let you read the book to, to find out what happens, if you're curious. But, but uh, uh, some events unfold, and... And uh, a, a great story, really. You should read it if, if you don't know what I'm talking about. But Silas Marner has a, it's about this miser, and he, it has some great redeeming qualities in the story uh, that we can learn from. But I'm going to tell you about another miser. This was uh, uh, a lady that's given uh, the, the title America's Greatest Miser. And her name was Hetty Green. And Penny Green, she lived quite the pauperous life. She ate cold oatmeal because she said it would cost money to heat it. I mean, think about that. Uh, and if you think that's bad or, or cheap, listen to this. Her son uh, actually suffered a leg amputation because she delayed so long in looking for a free clinic that his case became incurable, and he eventually lost his leg. Now, that's a horrible story. And, and by the way, that, that reminds me of my parents. Now, now my parents aren't misers, but I remember when I was in college, my freshman year, I broke my ankle, and my whole foot turned black. And, and I was, you know, like I could barely walk on it, and my parents said, basically, they told me to walk it off. And so I did. Yeah, I did. I walked it off. And so I, I, 
I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't know if it was broken or what, but I know it hurt really bad, it swelled up, and my entire foot was black. And I went back to school, and I hobbled around, and I tried to play basketball, and I really couldn't, and I tried to play a bunch of other sports, and it was tough, and I went through the whole summer, I, you know, worked on it, went back to school in the fall, played soccer, it hurt like crazy, but uh, you know, played soccer, won a championship, which was exciting. And then uh, went back home for Christmas break again. It had been one year, and I finally went to the doctors, and they x-rayed and said, yeah, you broke your, you broke your ankle. <laughs> and I said, well, what do we do? And they said, well, there's nothing you can do about it now. And to this day, my ankle still hurts me sometimes. And you know when the weather turns, and it, it's like it's going to storm outside, sometimes I can feel it in my ankle. And sometimes, it, if... You know, I'm getting out of shape these days, and if I, you know, start to, to get in shape, or maybe I play a little too hard in youth group, play a game with the kids, guess what? The next day, my ankle hurts. Just that ankle. Um, but anyway, my parents are great. I love my parents. Um, and, uh, uh, but I remember that, that it was kind of like just my responsibility to take care of my ankle, because all of a sudden I was in college, and, uh, and I, I didn't, and, and I had a broken ankle. Um, but anyway, this lady, she, she was crazy. She was too cheap to take care of her child going to the doctors. And so he lost his leg. Uh, and, and so she's called America's greatest miser because when she died in 1916, she left an estate that valued over $100 million. And think about that. This is the lady that would not heat her oatmeal because it cost money. Now, I don't care how much oatmeal you eat. It, you, it's never going to cost you $100 million to heat it. Okay. Uh, uh, and so Henny Green really is an illustration, though, unfortunately, of too many Christian believers today. Now, I don't think it's because we just are hoarding a whole bunch of wealth. That uh, you know, material wealth. I, I don't. I doubt there are hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars stored up in your houses from the from the congregation here. That would be pretty neat if there were, but I doubt it. And every single one of you right now is thinking, "Oh yeah, I wish. I wish." But the truth is that believers in Jesus Christ have limitless wealth at their disposal. And yet, we often live <coughs> like we're paupers. And, and it was to this kind of Christian that Paul wrote this letter of Ephesians. You see, uh, Ephesians actually is a, a fascinating book. And, and uh, well, obviously we don't have time to go through the whole book if you want to learn more, you can come to our youth group on Wednesday nights. Um, so we're going to go through the whole book. But uh, uh, Ephesians is a fascinating book. But, but here we, we, we start off the book and we're being told all this great wealth that believers in Christ have. And that's why I'm asking the question, are you a Christian miser? Do you have all this spiritual wealth at your disposal and you just kind of hoard it? And you don't use it. Now, when I told you the story of Hetty Green, you may have said, boy, I wish I was like that. I wish I had a hundred million dollars in my estate. And you probably said, if my child needed an operation or, or you know, to see a specialist, I wouldn't, I wouldn't care about the cost. I would take it. And you know what? If I was eating oatmeal for breakfast, I would heat it. <laughs> right up. You probably would do that. And, and you're probably saying, man, if I had that much money, I could do this and this. And you're thinking of how you could spend it. You know, there's a great movie. Um, I, I, I'm not endorsing it in any way. I haven't watched it in years, probably decades. Uh, but there's a movie called Richie Rich. And it's about this kid and he's, he's rich. And, and I think, if I remember right, he, he like, doesn't really have any friends. And, and uh, then he like tries to buy friends. And, and I, I can't remember all that goes on. or some... Um, you know, bad guys in the movie, and they beat the bad guys somehow, whatever. But, but I remember look, watching that movie and thinking, man, this kid, he has everything. And he had like a roller coaster in his backyard. 
And I used to think about that. I used to go out on my deck and just look at my backyard and say, yeah, you know what, I could put a roller coaster here and do a, a, you know, a, a corkscrew there and a loop-de-loop. -loop and a, I mean, man, I, if I had that kind of wealth, yeah, I would, I would build a roller coaster in my backyard. I would have a water park. I mean, I, I think of things that I would do with money. And I, I think we're probably all like that, especially as Americans, right? We like to, we like to shop. Some of you are like, oh, I hate shopping. I'm not talking like department store, you know, sitting in the chair waiting for your wife or, or however you do it. But I'm talking about, man, yeah, like I could use a, a brand new car. One that pretty much drives itself these days, right? Or, or you know, I could, I could use, you know, something, a, a brand new, you know, mower for my yard. Or, or, or whatever it might be. There's all kinds of things. Maybe it's the, the latest and greatest gadget, or, or, or iPhone, or, or whatever it might be. We, 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 we're consumers. And in fact, often in church, we become consumers. What does this church have to offer me? Well, as Christians, though, we are sitting on limitless wealth, as we'll see in a minute from uh, the book of Ephesians. But Ephesians is... Really a fascinating book. You know, some say that if you're going to preach expositionally, you know, going through, thought for thought, through the scriptures, verse by verse, or, or, or uh, really what it is, is it's taking the, the context correctly and, and, and going through it systematically that way. That, that's what we're talking about. And, and uh, some say that you could take the book of Ephesians expositionally and preach the entire rest of Scripture just from the book of Ephesians. So basically you could start Ephesians chapter 1 and go through all the way to the end and you could cover the entirety of the rest of the Bible just by going through the book of Ephesians. And there are some pastors who do that. Uh, I'm not going to do that this morning. I'm not going to do that with my youth group because they would probably get sick of it by the time we got to the end of Ephesians and they'd probably be gone. Right? Uh, they, they wouldn't even get the whole thing. But anyway, what we are, uh, what we are going to accomplish here today is, is a brief introduction of the book and then looking at the blessings that we have uh, as Christians. And so uh, Ephesians, of course, uh, the city of Ephesus that Paul was writing to uh, the church in the city of Ephesus. It was a great city. It was a large city, and it was very wealthy. Ephesus was, uh, was wealthy. It was also very wicked. There was a lot of idol worship. This is where the temple of Diana was, which is one of the seven wonders of the world. Paul had planted a church there, and he had pastored there for several years. And he had moved on. That's what Paul did, right? He would go in, start a church, he pastored there, he stayed, he, he had time invested there. And then he left. And he's writing now to address some things. Uh, it's also believed that the book of Ephesians, it was more widely circulated, and that was even its intent in writing. That yes, it was for a group of people in Ephesus, but that that letter was going to be spread around. Uh, unlike maybe some other books like uh, Corinthians, which is very specific to the people at Corinth. But anyway, here's these wealthy Christians living in a godless society, and uh, uh, Paul is addressing them, and any, the way he starts out his letter is pretty fascinating. If we read through the, the introduction, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus, and faithful in Christ Jesus. I said, this isn't like a, a super corrupt church like we see in Corinth. These are, these are people, he's saying, faithful in Jesus Christ. And he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. But then notice how he gets into it in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. 
And so Paul starts out just telling them, hey, you are blessed. He doesn't say, hey, you are blessed because you live in Ephesus and this city is rich. He says, you are blessed in Jesus Christ. And that's something we have to remember. The book of Ephesians could be really broken down into two parts. Because it really starts out and it's all about doctrine. It's all about what you should know about God and yourself. And then the second half of the book is all about more your, your works or your duty. So you have doctrine and duty. I heard another pastor uh, break it down into three sections, and I really like that. He, he broke it down this way. The church is wealth, the church is work, and the church is warfare. And I, I think that fits well also. But it's the church's wealth, the church's work, or, or you can say walk, or, or walk and work, and the church's warfare. Because that's really how the book is broken down. And, and, and in the beginning here, we, we just read the first few verses, but he continues on and on, and Paul uses these long paragraphs, I guess we would call them, and in English we put a bunch of uh, punctuation marks in there to try and break it up so we can understand it. But, but we don't I mean, kids today in school write that way, but they're not supposed to. Right? You're not supposed to just ramble on and on and on and on and on and on. But that's what Paul is doing. And he continues and he goes on and on and he gets into more detail about it. It's just so rich of doctrine about who God is and what you have in God and what you are to God. That's what Ephesians is about. And that's really chapters 1 through 3. But then in chapters 4 through 6, the, the there's kind of this shift. And instead of talking about what you have in God, he starts giving you instruction. And Paul starts telling the believers that, okay, here's how you ought to live. And, and, and if you notice in, um, uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, in chapter 4, verse 1, or sorry, verse 2, he says, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And we just read that. You were called. In chapter 1, he says, hey, you're called and you're blessed and all this. And he goes on and on and on about all that blessing. And then in chapter 4, he says, you got to walk worthy of the calling. He's like, you, you got to walk now. And this is what I tell young people. Uh, we often see in the Bible or think of the Bible or think of the Christian life as, hey, you got to do this, you got to do this, and you can't do this, and you can't do this. Isn't that how we look at the Christian life often? And, and Ephesians 4, one of some great verses that, that hopefully all of you have memorized. The last one of the chapter 4. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. My goodness, if everybody in our world would just live by that verse, what a great world we would have, wouldn't we? But yet, we don't for some reason. Do we honestly have a kind and tenderhearted and forgiving world? No, not at all. And so the, the question is, how do we do that? When I teach young people, I, I want them to be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving. How do you do that? What do you tell them to do? They go, just, just do it. Right? And this is not an endorsement for Nike, but, but isn't that what we want to say? Well, you just do it. How do I be kind? Just do it. Okay, but then I'm not kind. And I, maybe I say something that was unkind. You want me to be tenderhearted and forgiving, but, but yet maybe I am to this person. This person, look at me, I'm a great Christian, but this person over here, no way. I don't even want to see them. I don't want to be in the same room with them. I don't want to talk to them. Well, that's not very tenderhearted, kind, and forgiving, is it? No. So how do we do it? How do we get there? And, and there's all kinds of these instructions Chapter 5, we start walking in love, walk in light, walk in wisdom. We, we see all these things about marriage, and, and, and it's really all about relationships. Children, right? Everybody's favorite verse in the Bible, Ephesians 6, 1, right? You guys know it, right? Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. Who's, who's is that their favorite verse in the Bible? Come on, back row over here. Everybody, raise your hand. Right? Yes! 
<laughs> Favor first. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. But this is right. That, that's a great verse. I tell kids that all the time. But yet, uh, do we do it? No. Do we really love it? You, you might not want to shake your head too. I think you got your parents on either side of you, so you might want to be careful. This guy back here, he's like, no, I don't obey my parents. <laughs> And we, 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 we struggle with that. And here's again, it's a command. We're supposed to do that. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Servants, be obedient to your masters. I mean, it goes on and on. Every relationship, children and parents, husband and wife, fathers and, and mothers to children, right? Servants to their masters, people that are in authority over you. How do you interact and what you're supposed to do? That's your walk. But how do you do it? And the answer we just say is, well, that's what the Bible says, so do it. It doesn't really get me very far because I often fail to do it. You know, we did a, a, a little, like a video parenting session thing. We did, you know, it was a video and, and like we purchased the license and we had you know, snacks, and a bunch of families came to church, and we, you know, we watched the instruction on how to be better parents, and what we do wrong as parents, and I, I thought it was great, I loved it, and I, I think everybody agreed, you know, hey, this is good, but afterwards, a lot of the comments that we got was, well, it didn't really tell me what to do, and it didn't, it didn't say, hey, when your child acts up, do this, when your child goes wrong in this area, then, then, then here's the plan. Do step one, step two, step three. And that's not really what the conference was about. And, and multiple parents kind of, I mean, it's not like they were complaining, but that, that was their complaint about it. Like, it didn't really help me in that way. But the answer wasn't in here's step one, two, and three. The answer was in who you are as a parent. The answer wasn't, okay, when your child you know, misbehaves this way, this is how you respond. The answer was who you are when you respond. Right? Because if you're just an angry person that's mad that your children did not obey you, well, then you're a proud, angry parent. But if your understanding is that your child misbehaves and you are the you are parenting the soul of that child. It is your responsibility to bring that child up in understanding who he is before God. Then, with that perspective, you're going to respond to the situation in a proper manner. So it's who you are in responding. And that's the key. And I believe that that's what the book of Ephesians really is all about. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts. And in fact, we focus more on chapters 4 through 6 in Ephesians more than we do th through chapters 1 through 3. And why is that? Because we have all this doctrine that just tells us about all these things. And then Paul goes on and on and on about how rich the church is. And he's not talking about money. And, and we don't like that because we would rather be rich with material things than think about the wealth that we have spiritually. And so then we come to the second half, and it says, do this, do this, and we're like, yes, okay, this is telling me what to do. And it's like, be kind, okay, I'm going to be kind. And then sometimes we're not. So the answer, notice in, in what it says, uh, well, I'm in chapter 5 right now, and when it says, husbands, love your wives, it doesn't say, just love them, just do it. It says, as Christ loved the church. So if you want to be a good husband... How do you do that? And the answer is to think and to know and experience how Christ has loved you. When it's talking about uh, being kind, so in, in 4.32, it says, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. It doesn't say just do it. And when you don't do it, just do it. It says, Even as God in Christ forgave you. And so it's saying, if you want to be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving, the answer is not just do it, do it, do it. The answer is you have to know, understand, and experience how God has been kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving towards you. 
And so when we come to chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians, the answer to all of the do's, do's, do's in Scripture as a whole, but especially in Ephesians, like be kind, obey your parents, love your wives, wives submit to your husbands, obey those in authority over you, all of these relationship things of how we're supposed to live and walk as a Christian, the answer is not just do it, do it, do it. The answer is you have to understand who you are in Christ. And that understanding comes from Paul's explanation of who we are in Christ. And at the very base level of that, of who you are in Christ, is this. Is that you are blessed with every spiritual blessing. And so what I'm trying to explain to you here today is that you, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are extremely rich. You would have that hundred million dollar estate. You are wealthy beyond imagination. In fact, I can say this, that you have limitless wealth. We, we like that word, limitless, right? No limits. I mean, probably most of us have a cell phone that has a, a, a limitless plan, right? They can't stop you from texting or calling or, or surfing the web or looking at Facebook. They can't stop you and charge you because you, play, you pay a flat rate and you can do it as much as you want. That's what we like. But spiritually, you have limitless wealth. And so the question is, are you like Hetty Green? Are you like Silas Marner? Do you have all this wealth and you just keep it up and hoard it and hide it? Or do you spend it? I want to explain a little more about the wealth that we get. First of all, the source of this wealth or blessing. And so the source of the blessing we see in verse 3 is God the Father that has made us rich in Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Who has blessed us? Where does this wealth come from? If you're wealthy physically here on this earth, it is probably from either what your parents left you, or maybe what you've worked so hard for your life, during your lifetime, the sweat and the time that you've put in, and you've, you've made that wealth for yourself. And every single person here on a world stage is wealthy because you live in the wealthiest nation on the earth. And you, that's something, you didn't even do anything for that, except you're here. And so you are rich physically, materially, Financially, you might say, well, <laughs> I don't have a hundred million, Tom. I get that, but there are people that don't have, don't have clean water to drink. We probably waste more clean water in a week than people have to drink in a year in other places in our world. Think of that. You are rich, materially. And what I'm saying is you are rich beyond imagination, spiritually, and the, where does that come from? Well, it didn't come from the founding fathers of the United States of America. It didn't come from your parents or your grandparents. And it didn't come from your hard work or your sweat or your labor. It came as a gift, as a blessing from God the Father. It's God the Father, your Father. When you pray and you say, Heavenly Father or Dear Father or Father God, you are talking to that one that has blessed you. You're talking to the one that has given you that limitless wealth. The source of our blessing is God the Father who has made us rich in Jesus Christ. It is through Christ that you share in the riches of God's grace, His glory, and His mercy. Through Christ, and, and think about that. 
Jesus gave everything for, for you and for me. He is the one that, that, that went, he set aside the glory of heaven and became a man. I, I, think about that. I mean, you ever stub your toe? Hurts, doesn't it? Yeah, I hate that. Stubbing your toe stinks. And, and yet, when I do that, do you ever stop and think, you know what? Like, Jesus Christ, God, probably stubbed his toe. I mean, he was a carpenter. You ever get a splinter? Or, or, or oh man, splinters. Why in the world do we have to have splinters? Aren't they <laughs> painful? And, and Jesus was a carpenter. You think he ever got splinters? I would, I would guess he did. Um, pr probably back then, his hands were probably so rough that maybe he didn't get as many as I would if I all of a sudden took up carpentry, right? With my, you know, pencil, paper, cushion hands, I'd probably get splinters all over the place. But Jesus set all that aside to come to earth as a human. He lived a perfect, sinless life. It doesn't mean he never stubbed his toe. It doesn't mean he never had a splinter. It doesn't mean he didn't feel pain or, or, or fatigue. No, he was tired. He was weak. And yet he did all of that and he paid the ultimate price. Beaten beyond recognition. Sacrificed himself. Was crucified. He was killed in the, in the cruelest of ways. Shamed. Spat on. And he took on the wrath of God for your sin. And yes, we should praise Jesus every single day for that, for the gift of salvation. But who sent Jesus? God the Father gave his Son. Every blessing that you have comes from your Father in heaven. James teaches us that, that every good and perfect gift comes from where? From above, from the Father of lights. Your blessing, the source of your blessing, is from God the Father who has made us rich in Jesus Christ. Well, what about the scope of your blessing, the scope of your wealth? Notice it says, bless us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. It says that we have all spiritual blessings. We could also say it this way, that we have all the blessings of the Spirit. Okay, so it says you have all spiritual blessings, you have all the blessings of the Spirit of God. Now, what are we talking about? It's referring to the Holy Spirit. You have all of the blessings of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Paul mentions the Holy Spirit over and over in this letter, because it is the Holy Spirit that channels the riches from the Father to us. And this is important because when you are saved, what do you gain instantly? The scripture teaches us that we are indwelt by something, someone, and what are we indwelt by? It is the Holy Spirit. And it is through the Spirit of God that all of these spiritual blessings are channeled through. And so, given, being given the Holy Spirit, I, I don't know, in my mind, I think, yes, I'm saved, I've got the Holy Spirit, praise God, and I, I think I'm sealed. And that's my comfort. <coughs> that's what I take comfort in. I'm sealed. The Bible teaches that, and maybe we'll get to that later. But it's more than just being sealed. It is all the blessings of the Spirit of God. Jesus, the Bible teaches that Jesus had the Spirit with him. Think about that. How did Jesus live that perfect, sinless life? Through the power of the Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit of God that enables us. So, you might ask someone today, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed in Jesus Christ? And if the answer is no then the, the response to that question would be, then you are not saved. It's as simple as that. 
Romans teaches us that. Romans 8, 9. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If, if you don't have the Spirit, if you're like, well, I can't be kind, and I'm like, okay, well, then you need to live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And you say, well, I don't, I don't have the Spirit. Then you're not saved. That's what the Bible teaches. And so if you're struggling with sin, or if you say, man, I'm not really walking the Christian life like I should, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, Colin, and, and okay, you're saying I should have this limitless wealth, but I'm really not experiencing it. Then, then there's only two possibilities. One, you have the Spirit, and you're grieving Him. Right? You're quenching the Spirit inside you. Or, option number two, you don't have the Spirit inside you. There's only, only those two options. And so, if you know that it's because you don't have the Spirit, then you're not saved, and I, I, I plead with you, repent of sin, and, and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and He will give you the Holy Spirit of God. But if it's the other one, then, then stop quenching the Spirit. Crucify the flesh and submit and live unto Christ. Unless you have the witness of the Spirit, you cannot draw on the wealth of the Spirit. You want to understand and, and, and draw on the wealth that you have in Christ? Then... Recognize the Spirit of God in you and, and live like it. So that's the source and the scope of our wealth. Now how about the sphere of our wealth? Notice again in verse 3. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing or all the blessings of the Spirit in heavenly places in Christ. Our blessings are in heavenly places. In Jesus Christ. Perhaps uh, a better translation might read, in the heavenlies in Christ. Well, what does that mean? It basically means not on this earth. You might say, well, okay, I'm a Christian and I'm supposed to have all this wealth, and how come you know I'm having trouble making ends meet? Or how come I have this health problem? Or how come you know I I, I can't, you know, I want this and this, but I can't go and buy it because I don't make that much money, or I can't even find a good job, or you know, but I'm supposed to have all this wealth, Colin, but where is it? And the answer is, it's not on the earth. It's not physical. It's not just that you're going to have a bunch of money in your wallet. It's not what he's talking about when he's talking about every spiritual blessing. He says it's in the heavenlies. And this really sets in contrast those two people. Either you have a spirit or you don't. And, and, and so you either are interested primarily in the earthlies or you're interested primarily in the heavenlies. And Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so what are you focused on? Are you focused on just the things of the earth? We've had a, a crazy time in the past couple of years here in our country. And, and it's sad in many ways where our country is headed. I don't like it. But again, I, I, I love the United States of America. I live here. I enjoy the benefits of living here. Um, I, well, as a younger man, I would have fought for my country. I'm not so sure I'd be any good at it today. But this is not my home. This is not my final place of where I will be. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it saddens me. Uh, I, I hate to think of what my children will have to endure in the future. But guess what? I've got a better future. And my hope does not rest in what the United States of America will become. Do I care about it? Absolutely. Do I want to try and, and, and make sure it is a good place for my children to live? Yeah, who wouldn't? But that does not mean that my hope and my joy and my peace resides in what the United States of America is, or what my financial status is, or, or, 
or anything that this earth has to offer. That's not where my hope is. And that's not where your blessing is either. That's not where your wealth is. Your wealth is not in the physical things of this earth. Your wealth should be in the heavenlies. And, and there's a day coming where our eyes are going to be opened to what that all means. And it's going to be amazing. You're going to think that, that, that I remember as a, as a teenager, my brother and I were at my grandparents' house. They had a pool. We used to go there almost every day in the summer. But I remember one day in particular, I mean, it's burned into my brain. And we were going to go swimming. It was a nice day out. That we were inside at the moment. The AC was blowing. I had my grandmom's sweet iced tea in my hand. And uh, uh, I can't remember the snack. I had a snack in, like, in my lap. And I was in my, my pop-ups chair. And I had it, uh, the, the recliner up. And on the TV, we had a, a big-time soccer game on. And my brother and I loved soccer. And my brother was there, and I just remember thinking, like, this is the best day of my life. I'm watching this soccer game, drinking the tea, and I'm going swimming when this is over. Best day ever. You know what? I still think about that. Is it enjoyable? Sure. Do I have good days like that? Yeah. There's fun stuff to do here. But there's a day coming where that will pale in comparison. I mean, it won't even be a, 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 a blimp of a thought. It's nothing compared to what glory will be like. I'll tell you, I think heaven is going to be unbelievable. I'm not going to be sitting on a cloud with a harp. I, I, one, clouds, uh, if I was sitting on a cloud, I'd be flying. That would be cool. But clouds don't hold people. And I will be a people, right? We will have a body in heaven. And it's, a cloud isn't going to hold it. So either I'm flying, but I'm not going to play the harp. Because I don't think I really like harps that much. And it, it, it's just not all that appealing. And it can be nice in certain circumstances, but harps are not my thing. Heaven is going to be amazing. It's going to be fun. It's going to be glory. And of course, we're going to be with the person that made it all possible, Jesus Christ. Think of, think of if you could spend a day with the coolest person in the world, and you're thinking, oh, I would choose this person. It would be so fun. Magnify that by a million. And that's what you get in eternity with Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. But that is where our hope is. That's where our blessing and our wealth is. It's not on things on the earth, but it is in heaven. And the Christian's life should be centered in heaven. You know, in, in Luke chapter 16, Jesus called people that were not saved, he called them the children of this world. And that's not us. And for the Christian whose life is centered in heaven, our citizenship is in heaven. You can jot these verses down. Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. Luke 10, 20, our name is written in heaven. In Colossians 3, 1, uh, the, our Father is in heaven. And so our attention and affection ought to be centered on the things of heaven. You know, my physical father, he's in Pennsylvania. And I was just talking, uh, had, had, in the past two weeks, had two couples from youth group, like two, two individuals from youth group got married in subsequent weekends. What a blessing that was. Right, so for the past, June has been a crazy month. For the past two Saturdays, I've been at weddings, and they're both kids that you know grew up, that had them in school, had them in youth group, and now they're getting married. It's funny how, how they get older, and I just stay the same. It's amazing. But but the, the couple that got married yesterday they moved into Pennsylvania, and it's like it's like sad because they're not living up here, you know, and I don't get to see them anymore. But they're moving to Pennsylvania, which is where I'm from. And so I'm like, that's really cool. And we started talking about things to do in Pennsylvania, places to go, restaurants to eat at. And, and I'm excited for them. And you know, sometimes I think of Pennsylvania because that's where my father is. That's where my family is. That's where my roots are. And so I think of Pennsylvania, and it's beautiful there. I, I like Maine, too. Maine is beautiful and fun. But I miss Pennsylvania a lot. 
You know what? Our Father, it, it, he doesn't, his, his residence is not Pennsylvania. It's not in Maine. It's not in your home. It's in heaven. That's why he's our heavenly Father. He resides in heaven. And so that's where your roots are now when you're in Christ. And so our attention and our affection should be centered on the things of heaven. So how about you, Christian? Understanding the, the wealth that you have, where it comes from, the scope of it, the sphere of it. Now what do you do with that wealth? Do you hoard it? Are you a miser? Or are you experiencing it? Do you understand that you have it? Is it sitting there and you can spend it? And um, later tonight, we'll, potentially later today, we will look a little bit more at the wealth that we have as the church of Jesus Christ. But you want to know how to walk as a Christian, how to live as a Christian? And understand what you are as a Christian. And you are blessed, and you are wealthy beyond imagination. You have a hope, you have joy in Christ, you have peace. What a blessing. What a blessing. Let's draw on that wealth each and every day as we walk with the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the wealth that you have blessed us with. And, and I, I, I come before you now and I ask you to help us to see that, to know it. And, and in my own mind, I often focus on, on the duty aspect, what I have to do. But yet, as your word teaches us, you explain who we are first. And and help us to understand the wealth so that we can do the works. And I pray that if someone's here today that does not know where they'll be when they die, they realize they do not have the Spirit of God in them. May today be the day of their salvation so that they too can walk worthy of the calling, because they have the wealth that you have given. And for those of us that, that have the wealth, help us to understand that and to walk worthy. I pray your, your blessing on our fellowship here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let's close by standing together and singing, Blessed Be the Tide of Mine.